Um, thank you for coming out and spending your afternoon with us. We um, appreciate your presence here and talking about um, a lot of these issues and uh, successes and, and things that are going on within our community here in the Pacific Northwest with us. My name is Jordan Leonard, and I'm the membership and project manager here with the Pacific Northwest chapter. So that basically means I'm one of the guys that uh, artists from our area can speak to and uh, you know, the process of getting signed up, submitting music for award contention, and uh, just getting keyed into the community at large here that's in the Pacific Northwest. And then to my left, I have Andrew Jocelyn, who is an uh, amazing violinist, orchestrator, um, and also a composer. And then to my far left, I have Ian Moore, who's an amazing guitarist. Um, you know, he's also the leader of Smash, which, you know, we'll talk about some more, which is really great when it comes to providing musicians with healthcare. Um, so yeah, I'll just uh, let them go ahead and tell them more about uh, what they do. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, as uh, Jordan said, my name is Andrew Jocelyn. Um, composer, film score, artist, uh, co-writer, songwriter, all the above. Um, I've been doing music full time for I think like since 2002. Um, I've done everything from tour management to doing A&R to releasing my own record to figuring out distribution to figuring out how to handle my own health insurance after my house burnt down. Um, I uh, Taxes, write-offs, everything. I, I teach courses on um, music business and licensing and yada yada yada. The, the list goes on and on but um, the, the fact remains that I, I've just seen the sheer scope of what this industry has to offer and the pitfalls that we all as artists need to kind of worm our way around. So um, that's just a quick little briefing of who I am, um, Ian. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a primarily, I guess, a touring musician, um, a, a producer and um, songwriter. You know, the funny thing about music these days is um, when I was young, I've been touring for 35 years. Jeez. <laughs> but when I was young, it was much more binary. Like, whatever it was that you did was what you did. And as Andrew was um, touching upon, I think these days, anybody who's an artist of any type, and definitely this holds true for music, you do everything. I mean, I'm now learning how to video edit because you have to create video content. So, um, as well, similar to Andrew, my, uh, the, the scope of my career has changed a lot. And one of the things that I do think is interesting is how you have to adapt as the music industry and the world changes around you to stay relevant. Um, you can either be on the side bitching about what you don't like about it, or you can be in the middle of the road um, working with the changes and trying to make the best of it. So um, I think we've all evolved a lot, and that's, that's uh, my synopsis, I guess. Yeah, and I, I think to speak to that, um, as artists, intrinsically, we're a little bit narcissistic. We're worried about our own art. We're worried our own, about our own trajectory. And when another band gets the bill and you're like, what the, why didn't I get that show? Um, there, that competitive nature is kind of intrinsic to what we do. But a part of advocacy, and just touching back on the fire that I dealt with, um, I, I mean, we'll, we'll get into a way more about what the Grammys do and way more things there, but um, community. As musicians, we're a community, and we deal with a lot of factors that are pitted against us and that are there to exploit us negatively. And I think what really led me to advocacy and why I think advocacy is something that's really important for every single musician is because we are a community. And we really need the work on figuring out how to represent all our rights and because I mean, we'll, we'll touch upon so much stuff, but it's just, it's really important that um, you learn what is out there because if you're a lifer, you'll be doing this for another 25 plus years and your, your, your livelihood is on the line. So learning how to work with your fellow musicians and being a unified voice is that much more important. That's my first rant. I got like 14 more in me, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, most definitely. Um, so one of the things that I'm interested to know is how you guys first got your journey started in music. That's one. Um, and then also within your process of starting your journey, um, can you talk about the process of perfecting your craft and then going forward to monetize your craft and 
what are some of the things that you guys experienced in that process? Well, uh, I was, um, I tour out of Austin, Texas, by the way, so I live up in the Northwest, but my, um, I do a lot of flying back and forth. Um, I was going to UT, and I thought I might be a, a lawyer for a minute, <laughs> and um, I was starting to play around Austin, and all of a sudden I had an opportunity to, yeah, you guys didn't know that, did you? No, I didn't. I had an opportunity to, to do a tour, and I went into my humanities counselor, and I said, hey, um, I've got a national tour, should I take it? And she very well could have said no, and you know, that's stupid, and maybe I wouldn't be doing this right now, but... So I went on tour and I said, I'll, I'll re-enroll when I get done and still doing it. Um, but the one thing that I always tell people, I do, a, I run a couple of workshops. I do songwriting workshop and some stuff and I mentor a lot of young artists just because I've been doing it for a long time. I don't believe a whole lot in natural talent. I think that's a real cop out. I think we start with um, a series of things and maybe really at an early age, you might get some positive feedback that builds upon that. But in my case, just like Andrew, I've been playing music my whole life. I just practiced and played. And when I was 18, 19 years old, when all my friends were out, staying out all night partying and hooking up and doing all that stuff, I was practicing. I was writing songs and, um, you know, I find when I look at my success, those periods of time have been really aligned with the amount of work and focus that I put into them. So I guess it's, that's what it's been. I mean, I'm getting a little tired of working that much sometimes, but... <laughs> But it's what you have to do, and I mean, when you reflect back on anyone, and you might, you might see someone on stage and go, wow, these, you know, they look, look so effortless, but I guarantee you, there's nobody out there that just walked up and was like, wah, you know? It takes a lot of work behind the scenes to get to that point. So that's, that's how I got there. Um, so honing the craft and monetizing? Yeah. Um, oh, monetizing? Yeah, yeah monetizing. Monetize. I haven't figured that part out yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my parents got me started on the violin when I was five. Um, I didn't like naturally take to it, but I learned to love it over time. Um, so I, I went through the crucible of classical regimented practice for years and I hated it, but there was, um, there was a work ethic that was like impressed upon me because of that. And um, when I got you know, through high school and I was like offered like, you're gonna go to college, what do you wanna do? And it's like, I'd only been doing music my entire life, and I was like, I don't know what else I wanna do, God. So um, I uh, did my undergrad, and then in the middle of it, I was like, I don't wanna be a concert violinist. There's nothing else out there for me. There's no, I don't know the path, I don't know what to do. So I, I freaked out and joined a rock band, got an electric violin and just toured for 10 years. <laughs> uh, did not make a lick of money from it, but we made enough to sustain it. Um, which then I became obsessed with figuring out how to make this a livelihood because I have spent a lifetime of people telling me over and over and over you need a plan B and I hate that. I feel like the arts and the m level of craftsmanship and the level, the amount of time that we all put into our art, we need to be properly compensated at least enough to be healthy middle class working people. I, I, that's a God given right, I believe that. So I've spent like years and years and years trying to figure that out. And so a part of my journey is I, I started st getting like a master's in music business and figuring that out and doubling down, then tripling down and learning like, okay, film scoring, uh, A&R, publishing, international rights societies, everything that I could to figure out how to make this world work to my advantage. And um, Strangely enough, I've been able to kind of position myself at least in the Pacific Northwest as a kind of a go-to uh, orchestrator and arranger uh, and film scorer for a lot of artists. So I've, uh, I, I'm, I feel very blessed that I've had the opportunity to work with artists like Kesha and Macklemore and Mark Lanigan and uh, Tom Chaplin from the band Keen. And, but that came, that's, those are great blips on the map, but the thing to remember in this career is you don't make it. You're making it every single day. It's about the journey. You're not, there's not like a moment when you're like, I don't have to worry about work ever again. And, but that's the thing is with this industry, you, we're all freelance businesses. So a part of that is you really need to learn the, bez, the business acumen to help sustain yourself in like 15, you know, threads in the stream. And I, you know, learned after I had the fire, a part, a major thread is the community. Rising water raises all ships. 
you got to remember that. If you are there by yourself facing against the flood, you're going to get drowned. So it's really important to make sure that advocacy is also a part of your business. Because if you're there and showing that you care about the community and have skin in the game with the community, it, I don't know, art, music is a collaborative art form. And I, I, I'm a serial collaborator. So a part of that also is giving back to the community, other than just making money from it. So. Most definitely. And, and I think, too, an important piece of this, um, when it comes to being a musician and being a part of a community, um, not only your community of fellow musicians and uh, industry folks that you work with, but also developing a following with an audience. I think it's very key as a musician to have that and to constantly you know, improve and sustain that relationship that you have with your audience. Um, can you guys speak towards what are some things that you've done to go about creating that, uh, that following and that audience and how that plays into your daily life as a musician? <laughs> well, I mean, a, a lot of that, <clears throat> it's interesting, a lot of building an audience, is, as uh, Andrew was talking about, is building a culture. I mean, as much as we all like to think it's going to be the brilliance of the art that we make, it's really the culture that you make. And um, <clears throat> for me, the times when I've been the most successful have been the times when I've actually s spoken for the culture. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, a lot of times that was just being in a zeitgeist moment, creating the music that was of the time. Um, but being part of the community, like, I can't do it now. I'm 50 years old. I run a nonprofit. I'm touring all the time. When I go home, I'm sleeping. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, whenever I can, like when I'm in Austin between shows, I always go out. I try to support my friends. I try to not just talk about my own art on social media, for instance. It's not just a thing. I mean, uh, empathetic thinking and resonant thinking is a really big part of culture building. Mm -hmm. And when you see somebody that's really successful, oftentimes that's what they're doing. If you're always celebrating yourself, people get tired of it. People like to celebrate somebody that seems to be thinking about everybody but themselves. And even the illusion of that can be successful. But if you really are that way, it's a home run. I mean, that's, that's the core. Mm -hmm. Like when you listen to a Bob Marley, do you listen to him because, oh, I mean, he's a great songwriter and he's got a cool voice, but don't you feel like there's this other cultural uh, element bigger than him when he's singing? Or do you? <laughs> I mean, I think that's the point. Or anything that you like. Um, oftentimes with young bands that are coming up, the things that's really exciting that I'm a bit jealous of is everybody in the scene is part of the world. The, the person that works at the, the vintage store down the shop, the person in the coffee shop, the person that's the producer, they're all part of the same team. And that's why a lot of times why you feel that energy, it's so exciting. Yeah, that's, that's I think how you build it. Yeah, I think the, uh, again, the, the rising tide raises all ships. Um, I, I don't think individuals make it. I think <laughs> scenes make it. Yeah. Um, and I, I got to see that firsthand with a number of artists, um, especially like Macklemore and Ryan Lewis is a great example. If there wasn't a Seattle hip hop scene that was so insular and that they, they, I mean, Blue Scholars and Common Market and all these artists were always repping each other having them in each other's music videos and being like, yo, man, this guy's great. And like, I'm gonna have you open for my show. And then like, I'm gonna go on tour. Greaves went on tour. He would bring Ben Haggerty and Ryan Lewis on the open and blah, blah, blah. And I, that, that scene and that continually um, giving honor to people that came before you, but then also helping the younger artists come up. Like, I try and make sure that I, um, uh, from a compositional standpoint, uh, I'll bring in assistance, um, but I, I, I'll have them be like, hey, I'm gonna give you a scene from a film, can you score this for me? And let's, I will teach you and give you your opportunity. Like I, I did a film score recently where the featured instrument throughout the score was a piano player, and I got this young kid that was just getting started and, and never really recorded in the studio before. And it was, a, it was, kind of hell at first, but it was like, I want to give you this opportunity so you understand what's really happening in, in the scene and this, you know, like, but that, that in itself is building community. You're building your team, but you're also, uh, you know, the, the music mavens that are out there. If you go out to other sh people's shows and help continually promote community, it, it, that in itself is advocacy. 
you are helping the community be stronger. Maybe with your seven bucks to get into the door and it, they get the split off the you know, security and everything else, blah, 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 and then finally you know, they get their two bucks from you for your ticket, it's still something. And if you and get everyone else out to the show, it's still something. That's how scenes are made. That eventually will get people to a spot where they can be successful full-time musicians with s sustainable careers, not just a blip flash in the pan. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you there. Um, a lot of the, you know, with, with my work especially, a lot of it is making sure that we have folks in place who are there to work with each other to create an ecosystem. Um, I feel like a lot of times we have uh, artists, we do, you know, we're all artists here. Um, we do think about ourselves and our vision and our music because that's very important, you know, to be able to have that artistry and then you can build a community around but we also need to make sure that we're actively putting forth energy into the ecosystem itself so it can continue to turn and churn. Um, I'm interested to know, number one, you guys have definitely made your money very differently within your career. Um, what are some of the struggles that come along with um, sustaining income and then also just making sure you're continuing to develop your ecosystem? You know, it's funny, though. I mean, we, we do have a, we are at a different place, but we've done a lot of the same things. Yeah. I mean, I've scored a number of films and done a bunch of production, and yeah. he's done a lot of touring. Yeah. I don't know. You want to go? You want to? You go first. I, I have a big, <laughs> I, I, I'm well, letting I, the wheels turn on this Well, one. I'll say one thing. As a touring musician, it's a very interesting time. Um, the methods of, of information transfer have changed so much. So, like, for instance, when I come to Boise, I have a pretty good fan base in this town, but connecting with those people is tricky. Um, I've been able to make my money 100% through music making, but I've had to be resourceful. Uh, there have been times when touring was tough, and I actually I got I scored films, I did some commercial work. Um, if you're going to be a touring artist, you have to be committed to being a touring artist. It's not something you can just drop in and not go on the road for five years and then go back out. I have to hit so. My sweet spot is based out of Texas, and I hit those markets regularly. My fans know what's going on. I've got a, a connection with them, and I've built that over a long period of time. Um, I think it's changed a lot now. Um, when I was a kid, it was about going out. You go hit Denver. You hit Denver again that second time that year. I don't think it works like that anymore. I think the new consciousness is things explode. Things implode. They're over. They start. Um, so if I was managing a young band, I wouldn't say go out on the road right now um, and tour. I would say create awareness and tour behind that awareness if you have enough awareness to create a nice tidal wave. Because otherwise, it's hard to get people's attention. We're so distracted right now. Um, there are too many things. Again, when I started touring, no internet. Nothing else to do. You might go see a movie. Or do you want to go see the band that's playing? Now there's 8,000 bands playing. 8,000 channels of things to watch on Netflix alone. How do you possibly make a decision um, about what you're going to do? So you have to make a lot of noise. So um, I think you have to think about what you're doing. If you're a young artist starting out and you're interested in building that particular um, paradigm, I would say you focus on a regional um, awareness and you really build it up to where you're the so-and-so in this area, and then you start going to Seattle or wherever you are, and you utilize the networks. <clears throat> so we're here on behalf of the Recording Academy. Really quick, who knows actually what the Recording Academy is? Or just as a raise of hands, do you guys know? A lot of people don't. So the Recording Academy is a group that's based, obviously, puts on the Grammys, but the reason Andrew and I are involved in it is because it's the, it's the most powerful advocacy wing and it's also a thing that is great for mentoring. So if you're a young artist and you're living in Boise and you want to get to Seattle or something, you have to utilize the networks that are there. And the Recording Academy is one of the strongest ones because they have tendrils, we have tendrils in all of these different communities that can put you in front of different people and give you, so you have to be really savvy. And that's what I do notice, and we talked about this. Nobody knows what the Co Recording Academy is and it's one of the best assets for young or old artists out there. 
I mean, maybe just the piggyback off that and then I'll circle back on the question. Um, again, just to, to reiterate the point, like as artists, we, we get kind of in this narcissistic self-auditing mode where we're like, oh my God, I need to write, to write this next record and I need to get it out to my fans or I need to hit this, you know, this deadline with writing cues for a film and da da da. You, you get stuck in your self-contained little world and it's scary. And I think when I first learned about the Grammys, it was the first time I was like, as artists, we're misfits and miscreants and people don't understand us and they're always telling us to do something else. So it was the first time I was like, my clan, you understand me. I can bitch about being on the road or I can bitch about this and you understand the trials and the tribulations that we all handle. And it was like, finally, I have my like, you know, my AA meeting I can go to and be like, <laughs> hi, my name is Andrew. I hate social media as an artist, you know? And people would be like, yeah, me too. And um, I think that's really important because especially from a mental health situation, it's like you gotta know that other people are in the same boat. We're not alone. So just, I don't, man, I didn't even watch the awards show the la this last time it went around with the Grammys. Like, I, the, the bottom line that I, I think as an independent artist that's really important with that the Grammys have to offer is it's a beacon and a role model for our community. Not just Seattle, not just this, whatever, for all communities, these small little spots. It's a finally a conduit to the, the national consciousness of all musicians. We're all in the same boat together. We're all dealing with issues with the NEA. Like, that's going to get cut probably by, the, the, you know, like this budget proposal nationally or the copyright board doing stuff. Like, most of you guys are like, what is, what are you talking about? This is important stuff. This is why advocacy and having unified voice is important. At least to me, the Grammys are the first step to be like a part of a slightly larger organization or a much larger organization that actually is finely tuned to what's happening and can at least inform me, you know, and do something about it. Try to, because we in small, little, concentrated ways can evoke change, and that's what's really important about advocacy. We're not, people don't listen to artists because we don't speak collectively. We used to with the unions and stuff, but the artist unions are pretty, they're pretty lacking. Yeah. In Seattle, 96, our union got pretty much slashed because Seattle Symphony was like, nope, we're gonna create our own music guild and do our own thing because we wanna create, you know, we wanna record our own music and, you know, get money from LA, you know, by, you know, not having to deal with union rates. That undercut a lot of artists in the area. So I think, what was the original question? <laughs> so I can tie back, sorry. Um, I think the struggles, right? Yeah, it's kind of like the struggles that you face within your career. Like how, how to keep going. Yeah, how to yeah, keep how going. To keep going um, I concentrated world building, but it's slow. It's a slow burn over and over and over. Like if you're a songwriter, every morning waking up at nine a.m. and making it a consistent practice to write songs, and I think. The, the craft of consistency, I think, is very important as artists. We get, you know, you know, there's so much stuff going on in this and this, and like for me, because um, at, at a certain point, uh, say you're a composer, you continually put out music compositions into the world, and if you're having them listed with BMI, ASCAP, or whatever, eventually at a certain point, that stuff starts making you back-end royalties mm -hmm. and a consistent, sustainable back-end royalty. And uh, I think, but at first, when you first start, when you have like three songs up on your account or you're not making any royalties, you're making, that's when people are like, you can't have a sustainable career in music and blah, 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 and Spotify's the devil. And, you know, we're making a, a you know, one, one thousandth of the cent. Like who can live off that? You can't. But if you are consistent and you really are focused, you can. Um, pitfalls. A lot of people think that the way to get, make it in this industry is to do stuff for free. And that is really hard for me to handle because it undercuts the value of people that are already in the scene trying to make it work. 
I try and do a film score. Most music, I mean, it, were you guys here for the previous panel? Did you guys get to see that? Okay, they were talking about music supervisors and other stuff and, you know, film scoring. They're like, yeah, just go and free. find, go find a indie film producer or director and do the film for free. I wanted to cringe at that because what happens is when you don't think about the community as a whole and you're like, I'll do it for free because it's going to help me, it won't help the community, that undercuts everyone and you because what happens is I can't, I, I, I really think the har one of the hardest challenges as artists is valuing the art because everyone's consistently putting it down. If you go on, you know, most music supervisors, they won't tell you this, they want to be under budget. Yeah. They don't really care. Like, they want the coolest thing for the lowest dollar amount. They'll go to Music Bed, they'll go to uh, Pond5, all these websites where they can buy a song for five bucks and it's completely royalty free, that's it. They have it in perpetuity. I can't compete with that. I can't write a song for five bucks and live off that or Fiverr.com. Come on. Like, that shit shouldn't exist. Sorry. But the bottom line is rate setting. I think that's a really hard thing to do. And I think one thing that I, I'm an advocate for is getting people in the same room talking about a bare bone rate. Just something that's like hey, I need to make at least 25 bucks an hour. Can we just agree together that we're not going to undercut each other, you know? And I think bands need to do that with touring, with bookers and promoters, with orchestrators, with film composers. Like, I think the idea that you have to do stuff for free, I know it's important, and I know it's important to do that in terms of building a portfolio. If you're right out of college and you just, you're trying to get your foot in the door, but don't do it for so long that all of a sudden you completely jack up everything for everybody else that's still trying to make a living. Because I'm doing this the rest of my life, and I hope you guys will too. That's the bottom line, mm -hmm. you know? So that's a huge, huge struggle that I think we as a community do to ourselves. Yeah, I totally hear you on that. Um, you know, valuing the art is very important because at the end of the day, um, music and communities especially um, you can see it happening in cities around the country um, when a city has a very strong arts and music community the city generally you know it makes a positive impact you know it brings folks into the city to check out all the cool stuff that's going on um, and it positively impacts businesses that are in the city um, and it creates an industry that's very sustainable for folks to come to and join, um, especially. I want to hear what you guys think about some of the resources that you guys have uh, accessed that the Recording Academy um, has made available for artists. And uh, Andrew, especially, you were talking about your house burned down. Um, so I think that's a powerful story for everyone to hear with what exactly happened there, your house burned down, and then what were yeah. the, the next steps that came Yeah, out of that? so um, I was living in an apartment. It was kind of like a slum lord's uh, heaven. Um, I was, I, and it was great, because in Seattle, I was paying like 600 a month, and I was like, yes. Oh my God, I have an oasis where I have to pay nothing, but it's like we had a circuit, like I had a circuit board that was like the old like screw-in like uh, um, bulb system, like. This, this thing was about ready to burn down. So um, uh, I was on tour in San Francisco, and I get a call from my neighbor saying that essentially my house burned down. The hardest thing, though, was my cat died in the fire. Yeah, and that, oh, I can't. Mm, don't let, let's not talk about it. So I, 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 being freelance, I make money when I work. And when I'm not working, I don't make money. And when I came home, I had no gear. Everything was gone. Uh, the, one, the, the weird thing is the one thing that survived was my frickin' violin. So there's some bizarre, magical, like, spiritual energy there. Like, didn't even lose, it, it didn't even lose its pitch. Wow. And it was under the bed that burned. Wow. That's oh, amazing. my goodness. And I, that, this is where I'm like, you know what? Like, in this career, like, I do feel like there's a level of faith in some I don't know what your spiritual beliefs are, but I do feel like there's something. We are conduits to something, whatever you want to believe. But that was my moment of like, woo. Um, so the problem was 
my insurance, I had a, I had like bare bone like renter's insurance that like did not cover anywhere near what the value of the stuff was. And obviously that was a, uh, an error on my part, which, you know, I should have been better with my insurance and everything else. But regardless, I, I had $75,000 worth of gear and stuff just erased years and years of recordings, hard drives, and the mental toll that takes alone, not just the monetary, was immense. I was like, I need to get a day job, I'm done. This is it, I'm done. And um, one program that I know probably 98% of you guys are not aware of, that's available to all of you as music professionals, is this organization called Music Cares. They're, again, amazing. Um, I called them crying. I was just like, I don't know what to do. I have no money. I'm fucked. I, I like, what? Can you help me out? I had a rep call me within like two hours and was like, here's the application. You just need to show that you're a full-time musician and yada yada yada. And you're, you know, you have to give them all your vitals. And they're like, we have set aside fifteen thousand dollars for you to get your feet back. Yeah, Whoa. What you, that's amazing. And then the music community in Seattle. Ooh, I'm gonna get, yeah. Man, this is why advocacy is so important. The Seattle music community came together, put a benefit show for me, and a GoFundMe, and oh man, $18,000 later from everything. That's something to get you on your feet. If I didn't have that, I, I was battling insurance for my livelihood. I was gonna move back in with my parents. Hmm. I didn't wanna do that. I'm a self-respecting human being. I'm working my ass off. I worked since I was five years old in this craft. Why do I have to have a plan B? That's why there's organizations like that that's available to us, but people don't know. So yes, absolutely. Like, Music Cares is a huge important wing of the Grammys. That's available to all of us and to all artists that you guys work with or that are part of this community. And as I said, the mental health portion, they continually help me. Like if I need to go to a therapist, I, they pay for it. And that's amazing. And I think that's really important to, to take note that this is an organization that has our back. That's amazing. That has nothing to do with the Grammys and the awards and Beyonce and you know Cardi B just won this. It's like, I don't really care. I care about the fact that you helped me continue my career. I got your back and I will advocate the hell out of that. Like, that's really important. And I mean, he's running a whole program called Smash that is just as important and I mean, you should talk well, about Well, I was that. just going to say, though, that so mu what Music Cares is, is I, I call it kind of the oh shit foundation, <laughs> which I think, I mean, you can't officially call it that. But what it is is that anything that happens to you, it's a, it's a net. Like if you have, if your house burns down, a number of my friends um, have gone to rehab because unfortunately there are a ton of drugs and alcohol, obviously, in the music industry. And people have, have their lives have been saved. Um, medical conditions, cancer. We had a, a guy in uh, Seattle who uh, had a heart attack. So it's an amazing organization that also offers mental health. Um, and they really are. They're a safety net for music professionals. And it's everyone's duty to explain it because there really is a lack of knowledge. The resources are there. So telling people, you know, music airs will save people's lives. It really will. I mean, it's very people very close to me. I run a nonprofit called Smash that's a localized um, nonprofit that provides health care, advocacy, and education for Seattle area musicians. So we're focused just on the Seattle area right now. But what my goal is, is once we get it to a certain point, is to make it to where it's replicable. So if you're in Boise or you're in Portland or you're in wherever, you can plug into your local laws. Because here's the deal. <coughs> ACA is awesome, and I'm really grateful for the benefits that it is, but most musicians are living on a razor's edge. It's what we do. It's kind of Andrew keeps going back to that. 
It's reality. If I did anything else, I'm so ambitious, I'd have plenty of money, but music, it just, it's a tougher w road to go. <laughs> so, it's not um, a career, it's a calling. It's a calling. So mm -hmm. if you are in this world, you have to take advantage of the things, and it is part of our individual responsibility to build up a network of things to take care of our community, because it will allow people to be successful. If you look to Austin right now, where I tour out of, and you wonder why there's so many bands breaking, because there's a lot of bands breaking out of Austin, it's because of HAM, which is healthcare, which is similar to what we're doing. It's because of Black Fret, which is a grant-based system. So people can afford, musicians can afford to make records. They don't get screwed when they have a healthcare scare. It allows them to have the baseline to be successful. And at this point, when the music economy is very challenging, we need that support. We need that, those support systems. Thank you so much for um, sharing your personal story about it, um, both of your personal stories. Um, you know, just to piggyback off that, Music Cares does so many great things um, for uh, musicians and industry folks around the country. Um, we kind of touched on this a little bit. So we're the Pacific Northwest chapter, but there are 11 other chapters that are um, Wh that which are includes Boise, by the way, mm -hmm. just in case you guys didn't know. Yep. We so represent Boise, you. <laughs> we do, which I think is a, an amazing thing. We appreciate uh, Tree Fort for inviting us out here um, to connect with all of you great folks in Boise and in Idaho as well. Um, I would also like to ask you guys, what are some ways in which folks here in Boise and in Idaho can actually go about getting involved in advocacy through some of our channels? There, th it's interesting. There's a there's a couple of resources that I regularly go to. Um, the Future of Music Coalition. I don't know if you guys have heard of this organization. Um, Future of Music. I think it's futuremusic.org. I think it's the website. They regularly are updating their feed with things that are happening on a national level. Like um, like I mentioned before, uh, the Copyright Board um, has voted to increase. Um, Songwriting royalties, super huge, 4% increase uh, from 11 to 15%. But uh, companies like Spotify and Amazon and you know these big tech companies are appealing that case. That's really difficult to hear and that's just another example of the big world exploding artists. But from an advocacy standpoint, um, what's really great about that resource is like, oh, I'm aware, now I'm gonna I'm going to galvanize my team and my people and be like, hey, you need to know about this. This is stuff that's happening that most of us don't even know. And we need to talk about this. And we need to let the community know. We need to let music fans know. We need to let... Because the thing is, if artists are affected, the whole music economy is affected. The bookers, the, 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 the labels, the, everybody. So from an advocacy standpoint, like first, yeah, so Future Music Coalition... Um, I'm a, uh, an elected uh, governor with the Grammys, and we have, Ian and I are um, chair and co-chair of the advocacy committee. So we are continually um, tr trolling <laughs> for these situations that are occurring, you know? Um, and we, I mean, recently, w uh, do any of you guys know about the Music Modernization Act? Have you guys heard about this? That Go was ahead recently and raise your passed. hand if you know about it. Okay. That's okay. And that's why advocacy is important. Yep. 90% of it is just being informed. That's it. Like just understanding what's really happening on a national level, both communally and on the larger scale. And I mean, for Ian and I, we went to our state representatives and in our districts and talked to them told them our stories and why it mattered. And that was so impactful. We saw state senators being like, I had no idea. I had no idea that musicians are businesses. I had no idea you like money. Like, <laughs> are you kidding me? But that's the power of having a voice as normal, civic, every single one of us is a voting person in this American society. Our job as voting members is to have a voice, to share that voice. That's the beauty of a democracy. As a democracy with music, we need to make sure that our voices are heard as 
content creators, as people that are buying into this, this industry that's always getting exploited. Step one, talk to your state representatives. Find out the things that are happening and people that are making decisions in your name and do something about it. So like that's, you know, Ian and I are always a part of that and I'm ranting, getting off on a tangent, but no, I mean, you know. You're basically, so what can you do? So the musicians union, we touched on this before, it should be a big strong union, it's not. It's do it doesn't really serve a whole lot of purpose. So. If you're wondering like where you can put your energy, well obviously in your local community and, and uh, building up coalitions within the town, getting to know the civic officials, here's the deal. And kind of what Andrew keeps talking about, it's not anything um, negative in core, it's just the nature, the civic leaders are not gonna naturally take care of the art sector, they never will. They're gonna love the tourism that comes in, they're gonna love the dollars. I'm sure that they're happy that Tree Fort's bringing in some tourism and stuff, but they'll take that money. We saw that happen in Austin. So you have to hold them accountable. And the reason why we're involved, or I'd s for speaking for Andrew and I, is because the Recording Academy, we are able to make physical change. The Music Modernization Act, which was just passed, was the first pro-music bill in the history of music ever. Just happened. Just happened. Yeah, and, and, and Republicans and Democrats supported it. Across the board. It. This is, it was, it was unanimous. unanimous. I mean, yep. this is amazing. So people are, everyone's affected by music. So what was happening is that um, the people that were making these laws, they're tech companies. Uh, Google executives that were State Department people get in the weeds with that, but basically they were writing the laws and nobody was providing a counter argument at all. And so just as you guys to various degrees might not know, a lot of my fans, every night I talk to my fans, they go, how can we help to support you? And I say, well, look, here's the deal. Streaming, we don't make a lot of money. Do what you want as consumers. I'm not saying don't stream, but, but just so people know, it's killed the economy. It really has. It's um, where we used to make a living through music sales. Now we make much less of a living through streaming. So this is a huge deal. So knowledge about this bill, knowing how to, uh, getting to know, like, we did this in Seattle. If you're doing this in the towns that you live and you're talking to your elected representatives, they're gonna start to realize, like, I had no idea. The beautiful thing about music is everybody's a music fan. Even if they think they're not, there's always somebody who's like, oh, I used to play in a band in high school. Like, we literally were with Pramila, who's one of our representatives in Seattle, and her son's a musician, and all, she's, become, I mean, this, she's become one of our strongest representatives in the country. Like, she's helping to pass laws yeah. So you can make a huge difference. Yeah, and we just told our story. Yep. That's it. That's all we did. Like we didn't, we didn't sit there and be like, "This is a legislation thing that you need to pass." And we didn't, you know, I, it was just sharing a story. That's yeah. it. You now, know, I'll tell you straight up too. I'm not a bullshitter about stuff. I don't join. And I told, I told Michael uh, from the Grammys, I'm involved with this because it helps the community. And there are not, there isn't a whole lot of representation, but being involved, the amount of money it costs to be involved in the Recording Academy and what you can accomplish uh, politically for music and for culture is probably the, one of the best things. I'm not sitting up here. I got a lot of other stuff to do other than this. I'm doing it because actually having more representation here will be good for this community. And what they're doing with Tree Fort and like just walking around reminds me a lot of early South By in Austin when they were building that music economy. So you guys have some tendrils going right here. It needs to be nurtured because it's a dream right now that needs to be watered and, and grown, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's protecting that and making sure it's not exploited and drained. Um, yeah, just the, just the advocacy. I don't know. Um, just the importance of realizing that through unity and being, I, I, I think the thing that's just amazing, I'm sorry, I'm kind of trying to piece together a jigsaw puzzle of uh, ideas here. Um, a lot of artists will fall into the negative kind of cycle of just going into their bedroom and being like, I can't make it. I'm not gonna make enough money. Spotify wins. Okay, I give up. I'm gonna go and go to college or you know work that day job, that's it. That's it. So many artists have disappeared. Great, amazing artists have disappeared from the world because of that. And I think instead of sitting around bitching about the system and that it's not working for you, make it work for you. 
and realize that you're one voice and make sure and realize that well, guess what? You're not going to your one voice is not going to be like the super change or whatever, but you don't know. You never know. Uh, you never know. You never know if your your specific story to one state representative could be all the difference. And it doesn't even have to be state representatives. It could be city council, it could be just I mean, in Seattle alone, we had something that was recently passed where it was a bitch to park in front of music venues. Find parking just to offload your gear so you can make sure you make sound check. We had a bill that was passed where we had parking, little little parking spots set aside for musicians. That's amazing. That small little change makes our life uh, just a little easier to deal with. And that was from advocacy and just being there and talking and telling people the story. That's all it is. Because like if you share your story, people will listen. Mm. Yeah, you know, people will listen. Um, it's something that happens all around the country too. We have an event that's called District Advocate Day where uh, we take music creators to our um, local congressional leaders. You know, and this happens throughout the 50 states. I believe it was two years ago that we had participation in all 50 states, um, having advocates go forward and speaking their truth to those leaders, um, which I think we were talking about the MMA a little bit ago. That was one of the main reasons um, I feel why it passed. I think that's why it passed. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, especially looking at Boise, you guys have a great foundation. This festival is awesome. We've been able to walk around and check it out some. So I think District Advocate Day is, you know, especially is a great tool because, you know, with your help, um, we can get voices in Idaho going and contribute to the nation's effort of uh, chatting with these folks and just letting them know how important music is. The other thing that's really cool is that <clears throat> there are different districts and uh, the Pacific Northwest District, as you can imagine, is much more independent than LA or New York. So <clears throat> there is a national voice that, 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 that the Recording Academy has, but in Portland, Seattle, Boise, we also represent Hawaii and Alaska. We're different, we're different. We have different needs. We're much, for instance, we're much more civically minded we want to do stuff like we're working on stuff in Seattle and in Portland. We're trying to get stuff going on a town level because that's where it starts, right? If you want to make change, you make change locally, and then the local stuff filters out. But we're able to do that. We don't have to, because to, L.A. is a whole different scene, right? L.A. is all, yep. uh, L.A. is L.A. They have a, yeah. Different priorities. Priorities yep. are very, very different, different there. <laughs> we're all independent labels. I mean, there's no, there are no major labels in Seattle. It's sub pop and labels of that type that, mm -hmm. that, that nurture underground talent. So our organization, it's really diverse. It's diverse culturally. It's diverse gender-wise. It's diverse different types of people. There's a lot of collaboration, and I think it really represents you know, who yeah. we are as people. I, I like to think that we're uh, the scrappy chapter. We're all the cockroaches that no matter what, a bomb goes off, we're still going to be making music. Like, I, I, that, I, I love that. I love the fact that we're, you know, we're so kind of like away from the center of the music industry and blah 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 that like we're gonna do whatever it takes to make a a job out of this you know so here's to you guys <laughs> yeah. so i think too you know we've been talking about the recording academy advocacy making an impact in your community um i would also um like to ask you guys about the program that we have that actually sends artists or you know if artists feel so inclined to go to DC to then you know go on the steps of Washington and advocate for artists rights um, can you tell me a little bit about uh, your experiences or what you've heard about Grammys on the Hill what's that kind of like I I've, I've never been but I um, I think it's a really important program it's just a, a much <clears throat> like what Ian and I were talking about earlier about meeting with uh, Pramila and I've done, I've, I've spoken with uh, Patty Murray and Maria Cantwell um, in Washington State. Um, I haven't done any kind of advocacy work here in Idaho yet, though I would love to. Um, I, there's just something really powerful about being in front of a, a, an elected official and telling them that I'm, I'm someone in your district and I need your help. And 
sharing that story. I, I don't, it's, it's, it's almost seems counterintuitive. You almost feel like you need to have the whole business plan and everything and being like, well, this is my piece of legislation that I need you to sign off on or blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like you almost feel like you need to be a uh, adept at politics. No, it, it, it's, it, it's fur that couldn't be further from the truth. And I think um, one of the things that's amazing that the Grammys also do, other than district advocacy, what I'm talking about, the Grammys on the Hill is where they will take um, representatives from all 50 of the states and get them in front of Congress, in front of the elected officials, and tell them, like, hey, this is really important stuff. Like, because all these other big tech companies and everybody else, they already have representation and lobbying strength. Yep. The Grammys right now, and maybe like the Nashville Songwriters and the R, uh, RIAA, the Recording Industry Association, like, there's, we do, there is certain groups that are there to help with the music industry, but like, not, not us scrappers, not the independents, not really. And I feel like the Grammys are one of our best representations out yes. there right now. Do you, do you guys, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm exaggerating, but it seems to me that the, the, the relationship of digital culture and where we're at now is probably the biggest change in humanity since fire. Definitely up there, right? Metal, maybe. The, I mean, it's a huge, we're on the, the, the tip of a gigantic sea change. And what's happened, as we're saying, all the laws are being written by tech companies, period. So music creators have no voice in the dialogue right now. So being able to tell the story, senators aren't, I don't think that they're inherently bad people. They're just representing their constituents, and the constituents are lobbyists. So if you've got a bunch of people talking to you every day going da-da-da-da-da-da-da, when we do Grammys on the Hill, it's the opportunity for musicians to tell their story, for music makers to say, this is what's going on, you know, and it's eye-opening. And when you get everybody together at the same time, you can make an impact. I think, I think the, the thing that obviously we keep coming back to is the same story. Individual voices might seem weak independently, but unified, when you get an opportunity to funnel them in, we actually have some power and we can affect legislation. And so basically, the Recording Academy organizing the Grammys on the Hill and District Advocate Day is how we pass legislation that hopefully is, you know, it's making better royalty rates, it's yep. ensuring that producers are credited when they need to be credited. Yeah. There are major things that we maybe not, it's not the scope to talk about the detail today, but it's fundamentally changing the music industry in a positive way at a time yeah. where everything else has been bad. Right. We've had nonstop bad laws for music creators for the last 40 years. Not one good thing has happened. I'm not saying that to be negative. I'm saying how important it is. And, and Grammys on the Hill is probably the, yeah, that component that helped to shift the paradigm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's been a huge component in shifting that paradigm. Um, just as we're going along, um, if you guys have questions as well, we want to make sure that we're answering questions or um, if you have any concerns with advocacy and what's going on right now, get information, totally shoot your hand up. Um, what are some of the things now that are happening today that you guys want to, you know, make sure the community knows that are going on that we need to, we need to pay attention to? Yeah, I got, I got a laundry list. But oh, yeah. one, one thing, um, the local Radio Freedom Act yep. is one thing that's uh, a lot of senators are starting to sign up for. Um, it's... <clears throat> Uh, just just to kind of like speed through some of the music business stuff. Um, we're one of the few countries we do not pay performers for their neighboring rights and their royalties for their performance on radio. Songwriters are paid, but like not the actual Wait, we're artists. The, we're the actually only country other than North Korea, right? North Korea, China, and... China. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's called neighboring rights, but it's one of those things where... Um, Radio stations, terrestrial radio, is they've been grandfathered in and have benefited from not having to pay out these royalties, which w they should. I'm sorry. Um, it's not going to put them out of business. And th the thing is, and this is the, a much larger scope of stuff, Europe collects neighboring rights. And because they do, um, if you have a song that you wrote here and it's being played on the radio in Italy, you're not going to get the money for it. 
Yeah, because we don't pay them. So right. It's a so it's a yeah. The re the reciprocity is not yep. there. So there's years and years and years and years and years of back royalties that we're never going to get as healthy working middle class American businesses. That is so insane to me. So I for for one, that's something just being aware of one. But two, talking to state representatives and being like, why did you sign up for that? Like, this is how it's affecting me as an artist. So that's one, the local Radio Freedom Act. Yeah. Um, just, uh, we, we touched upon it earlier, the, the copyright board um, and their passing of uh, increase for songwriter royalties. Super great, super bad that Spotify and Google and Amazon are challenging that. Educate yourself and then reach out to the board of directors of these companies, write emails, get people that you know to write emails, call them, harass their, their lines. I know this is like, all of a sudden it's like, oh, let's just like, but it's important. They need to hear from, from us, from the community and understand what's going on. It's the same thing, but just the only thing that I would say is to break it down really factually is that the bottom line is that if, if indeed uh, artists were being paid from uh, radio royalties, <coughs> they'd be able to make a living. We are the only country that doesn't pay. So if you have a hit, I've had a few hits on the radio, you don't make a penny. You make some money through publishing, but I mean, you'd be able to literally have a, a successful life. The thing that, that um, with Spotify and Google, and who else is it, Pandora? Uh, Amazon, Google. Amazon. So this I is a really Pandora big deal, and this is a very binary thing. The royalty rate for streaming is unbelievably low, like, like ridiculous. It's really bad. Most artists cannot make any money. So this raising the royalty rate a little bit is not like, um, just to be really clear, it's not, it's not even fair. It's on the bottom side and not really fair, but it's less not fair than before. So the fact that, that Spotify is fighting that is ridiculous. So on a very binary level, if you guys want to support music and music makers, strongly consider canceling your Spotify account. I have a Spotify account. I'm gonna put out, I'm actually gonna try to uh, word a really nice missive to send to my fans and explain it, because again, we don't know. Apple Music is on board, and they are supporting artists, and they're not fighting the royalty rate. It's ridiculous. I wanna get in a room with these guys and just be like, what is wrong with y'all? Do you guys know the profit margins that Spotify's making right now? And they're doing these ridiculous deals where they're giving huge amounts of money to marquee artists to pull them onto the platform and then screwing all the independent artists. So just fundamentally, I never had a problem with Spotify. To me, this is a real line in the sand and a very simple thing that you can do to support local music and independent music. Yeah. Um, I mean, the bottom line, like I said before, is there's a lot out there to be angry about. And it's okay to be angry, but don't let it bring you down and not do anything about it. Talk to people. Yeah, about let it, it bring talk you to up. Your fans, talk, <laughs> spread the word, and then unify and figure out what best as a community you can do. And we're we're here because we believe in that, and that we're fighting for your rights, and that we'll continue to because hell, I'm I hope I'm 85 and I'm still making music. Well, I'd, I you know what I just want to hear young artist. I don't want it to just be a thing where nobody under. 25 even thinks about being an artist because there's no economy. It's awesome to hear the youth express whatever the thing is. It's the beautiful thing, right? It's what it is to be alive. And uh, that's a huge part. I mean, when a city loses that, like Seattle, Seattle's, we're, we're, we're struggling right now. I don't know if y'all been to San Francisco lately, but man, it's rough. The whole city is gone. East Bay's still happening, but hanging in there. When you have a city that supports music and art, you have a city that supports itself because once that heart dies, it's just a matter of time before the, the business is closed. You can't have vintage stores and coffee shops without artists and stuff. That drives the whole economy. It's all part of a big ecosystem. So you're just protecting your city. And, and if you're a music fan, you're protecting your, you know, what you believe in to start with too. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That was a great point. You know, we, um, we're definitely here to protect our ecosystems throughout the Pacific Northwest. Um, another thing that I'd say that's really powerful about um, what we're doing here is we're acting as a conduit to connect the various communities who are, you know, uh, throughout the Pacific Northwest. What are some of the things that you guys have seen um, with our work and how 
um, the Recording Academy has gone about connecting folks from Hawaii, so um, local Hawaiian musicians that uh, play Hawaiian music to, um, you know, rockers in Seattle down to jazz cats down in Portland. What's some of the, the things that you've seen about how we go about building community? Well, one of the things that's really, I think, is awesome is I love all the Grammy U stuff. I mean, it's, so it's local-based, but it, what it does is it pulls kids in who are just coming into, the, into this world and it allows them to kind of understand what's going on and be mentored. We have a mentor-based system. We, don't, we really haven't done a ton of stuff in Boise so far, and I think it's part of what, the reason why we're here is we've been really involved in Hawaii and bringing them into the, I mean, that's an amazing tradition that is not well represented in the United States. So um, I, think, I think just through the nature of everybody working together, we've, we've bridged a lot of communities. But for me, it's really the civic work yeah. that's done in each city, especially the youth-based yeah. work that I'm really into, the mentor stuff. Grammy U is awesome. If anybody's young and just get in the music industry, I mean, how does it work like, Jordan, how would it work here in Boise with uh, something like that? I mean, how do you implement something like that in this town? Okay. So, um, so Grammy U, like we're saying, is a program that's structured to help um, folks who are coming up in the industry. We primarily are looking at folks who are taking music courses, or if you have a degree, you're pursuing a degree in music, um, you would definitely be a candidate for that. So um, once you apply online, um, most of our programming right now goes through Seattle. So um, if you're down to make the trip, um, definitely love to have you. And so some of the things that we do with that program is we're putting you know, these young artists and future industry folks in front of people who are doing it right now. So I'd say a, a more recent example of this is we had a Grammy U sound check. So what that is is we bring a select group of folks down who basically sign up and they're like, yeah, I totally want to meet this artist. We get them in front of an artist. So this last one we had was with Sasa Shalom. Um, we've had... We've had folks like, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on his name. Um, a lot of his music is on the radio. Post Malone, there we go. So we've had uh, sound checks with Post Malone, Sasha Salone, a whole bunch of different artists uh, from different genres. We go there, we hear their sound check, and then we have a Q&A session with them. So any kind of like industry-related question that you might have for one of these artists, you know, who are at the top of their game, top of their genre, you have the ability to ask it, right? And a lot of these conversations, you know, these artists, they really love doing this because for them it's like their opportunity to give back and spread knowledge, you know, with students that are there. So a lot of times you'll have um, students asking questions, you know, almost down to like, what type of in-ears do you use, you know, when you're performing? They can go as, as small as that to as big as, hey, I live in Seattle. Is it necessary to move to LA? What are some of the things that you've seen within you know, your musical journey that you can share with us? You know, I feel like that is one of the biggest benefits of that program because it puts you in the room with some of the folks and for a lot of people, they're music heroes. You know? So we do that. We're also putting on events to help educate students with how do you enter the industry. Um, that could span from talking with managers, right? So if you have interest in becoming a manager, you can speak with one of them, uh, connecting students to those folks who are in their ideal profession, um, as well as down to master classes with, uh, with audio engineers and producers, you know? So it's a really powerful program that we have going on that's used um, primarily for, for youth, you know, college age folks. It's definitely something to take advantage of and, you know, to, to get in, it's showing that you're taking music and $50. So a couple of pizzas, just cut back on it, you know? So I think that's, that's another thing that we're doing um, that also relates to advocacy and giving young folks the opportunity to get, you know, an inside track in to the business and figure out what exactly they need to do to figure this out. This is something that we were talking about um, you know, music in and of itself, it's not a linear thing. There's no particular path to get in. Um, you know, it's a, a mix of being really great at your craft and when the opportunity strikes, taking advantage of it. So it helps folks Sometimes be prepared. Sometimes just dumb luck. 
Yeah, it's dumb luck, you know. But it's that it's like I said before, it's that that quiet, consistent, concentrated world building, that effort, because eventually little blips on the radar happen, and all of a sudden it's like, I just wrote something with Kesha. What the fuck? Like, it, and I would have never in a million years imagined an opportunity like that flashing on my radar. But yeah. it's, but that's the thing is, it's like giving model to that to to young kids and being like, yeah, this is an industry that's you can sustain yourself. It is possible. You know, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But yeah, I mean, uh, this is one of those industries where it's it is it's it's who you know, and it's not linear. It's it's difficult to understand. Like everyone kind of looks at our industry kind of like a black box, you know. Like, so how did Iggy Pop get big? Like how do how do I how do I become a music supervisor? You know. Like the last panel, they didn't really, they kind of give you kind of like hollow platitudes and be like, yeah, you just work hard and it kind of happens. And yeah, maybe you might join my team, but maybe not. And you're just like, what? That does not help me at all. I, but how do I become a music supervisor? How do I become a manager? How do I become blank? This industry doesn't really give you, there, no one's going to tell you, no one's going to handhold you through it. It's not like go to med school. And I, I'm I'm sorry to say, but a lot of music programs, um, institutionally, oh God, are very archaic. Yeah. Yes, go get your music degree and uh, you know get your ear training and learn the you know Western theory and all that other stuff. Great, that's awesome. Okay, how do I run a music business? How do I do publishing? How do I do licensing? How do I do a tour? How do I make money at this? Nope. And that's okay. But the, the thing is, again, it feels like a black box. So again, I, I, I do feel like it's our civic responsibility as artists to help other artists that are getting started to kind of understand that like, yeah, this path isn't linear, but it is possible. You know, we're all in the woods together. We're just kind of the blind leading the blind. But yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's awesome. It, it, Bird you know, box reference. It, it seems Bird to box. Me. Bird box. <laughs> it seems to me though that it's, yeah. it's pretty, uh, it is pretty, uh, not easy, but I mean, like, if you, wanted, if you wanted to be a manager and you're serious and you take advantage, especially the mentoring thing, like, for instance, if you came into Seattle, you can, you can hang out with the red light folks who are pretty high power managers, and if you're serious and you're, s you know, decently smart, you're going to get an opportunity. It's not, I, it's not, a lot of those things are not that hard. I just think people don't realize how to connect the dots. I think being a musician, that's a really, that's an, unlinear path because it's mm -hmm. not based on how good you are at whatever your instrument is it's really how you connect but a lot of the other industry things are pretty available especially mm -hmm. especially to young people i think as you get older it's probably harder <laughs> but yeah. if you're if like if you're 18 and you want to be whatever and you're willing to find the people in your community and there are some here in boise you don't have to go to seattle there are people that you know you could literally call like, I remember when I was 18 years old, I was a huge fan of the Neville Brothers. Hmm. And I, I went and literally called up, they were playing in town, and the guy, Art Neville, I go into his hotel room, he plays me the whole record of this record they're coming out with. The resources are always there, and all you need to do is approach them. I mean, a lot of people are so timid and feel like nobody's going to be open to what they're doing, and, I mean, they're, they're right there. So at this point, we have about five minutes left. So I want to open this up. Um, if you guys have questions for us, this would be a great time for that. Um, and we would love to hear your voice and uh, hear what you're thinking. Don't be shy. Yes, don't be shy. Um, first of all, thank you guys so much for coming here. This kind of felt a little like church for me, and um, I'm from Oakland. Amen. 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 Yeah. Um, I even cried baby. a little. Oh, from Oakland. Yeah. Yeah. Area. Yeah, and coming out of the wake of ghost ship and having close friends leave this world <laughs> from that, um, it's been really tough because all my friends are moving to LA. Like everyone. Yeah. <laughs> my, I'm seeing my community change too, and it's terrifying. Yeah. And I hate L.A. I'll say I'm it from tape. L.A. and I hate it. And that's why I'm, I'm like, from what L.A. Guys going I was born in L.A. and I hate it. Oh and it's man. it's one of those things where like, why 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 does why do we need to 
Be you know. Because they're not getting this information. I'm not getting this. We're, we're not under, like you guys, just hearing this has been like so helpful, but they're just thinking like, oh, we need to go there and then what's gonna happen? Is it this old school idea that like, some producer's gonna find you and then you're gonna become big. And like, er, there's mm. that old school mentality, like even if you're a punk rock band or a Joy Division, there's gonna be this magical man that's sitting in the back and is like, oh, Dude, I love that rep sound. Dude, Epic just heard our He's set. finally yeah, like, here. Like they're gonna be the biggest thing ever. And yeah. then like, they swoop you up and take you and put you, do the internet for you. And then they give you, you a 360 deal. Yeah, that's so rad. Yeah, Oops. it's like, oh. <laughs> and yeah, the fact that we're all doing this ourselves. I hate social media. I hate having to promote myself i hate i don't this isn't even a question i'm just kind of co-ranting co right co 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 this, yes. this is gonna be like I, a support group it is, or something. it is funny though <laughs> no that but that's what this is in a way like i mean absolutely i one thing that i think is really to our benefit nowadays sorry Ian, <laughs> is with the with tech as it is it's both a boon and a curse the boon is the barrier of entry for distribution, for recording, for marketing with social media. It's all available to you. Yeah. It's a hell of a lot more work, and you're throwing your little drop of into the ocean, but it's available to you. The barrier of entry is gone. We are now in a permissionless society. Right. You do not need to ask the gatekeepers for permission. But you it's don't. interesting you bring up that point because I'm seeing the same thing. It is decentralized. We don't need to be in LA and Nashville yet. There's probably, I'm seeing the same thing of more people feeling this need seemingly out of desperation to go to what they consider to be the epicenter. Whereas in reality, your chances of being successful are much better in a smaller community yes. if you're, you know, in rising up through that and then you go to LA or whatever at that point, you know, when you've got, if, if that's your goal. Right. Yep. It is interesting. Yeah, I find that to be a really interesting social phenomenon that I don't understand. Mm -mm. Yeah. Like I, I it is desperation. Yeah. It feels like a sinking ship, especially being in San Francisco Bay Area. Yes. Um, we're watching all the tech people get their buy their houses outright. Um, like everyone, it's just money too. You know, yeah. they're, it's like actually yeah, cheaper in LA on right a house now. And you're like, yeah, I can't. Yeah. You can't do the ten percent down. Like yeah. my wife and I just went through that. That's very difficult as an, an artist. Like. That's one thing that I advocate and try and educate artists on is <laughs> taxes. How do you save up for a house? How do you have a normal, normal? Wait, wait, wait. How about life? this? I how mean, do you yeah. get? How do you get a loan for a home, Andrew? <laughs> when you have a musician's oh income. You know what's hard is <laughs> yeah, Fannie and Freddie Mae. They don't recognize the gig economy. Uh, gig economy. That's what artists are. We're all giggers. We we go from from you know contract to contract to contract, making money, and doesn't matter how much you make you look like a giant risk. So advocating in that area is also <laughs> really important because it's like... I think that's another, th yeah. another avenue, and I know that, that <laughs> towns are... Seattle's working on this right now, but, but honestly, like um, uh, home loans for artists because you don't have the traditional pay stub that you can give somebody, and so you get high-risk loans which have high percentage rates which you already can't afford. Yeah, like a so 9.75 APR. That's a APR perfect example. Of plus something. you have to put $90,000 down on a that's house. Wild. We're, that's wild. We're working on that in Seattle. Yeah, it's like just on a long list. Yeah, anyway. Do we have any Rant. other uh, <laughs> any other questions? So I'm actually a law student. I'm going to, um, I'm currently going to Concordia University School of Law and I originally went to and graduated from music college, and during that time, I decided I want to be a lawyer, but I also want to assist musicians in their careers any way I can, so I'm looking at maybe going to copyright or mm -hmm. contract, that sort of thing. Is there anything I can do now before I'm licensed besides what you've mentioned so far? Uh, really, really, uh, obviously you're probably learning everything you can about IP, like intellectual property, everything. That's really important. Um, you know, um, yeah, there is a couple of things. There's this book called um, the Everything You Need to Know About the Music Industry, Donald Passman's book. Um, there's whole chapters on music publishing and music licensing. Oh. There you go. Look at Get that. that on camera. Bam. Boom. Bam. That's a. That's the community that's at work. That's a mic drop moment. That's amazing. Um, 
learning everything you can about licensing and publishing everything you can learn about um, international rights societies you know uh, so can in Canada um, everything uh, oh my god the APRA and Australia all that understand what neighboring rights are understanding all that because then you will when I'm spouting stuff about how local radio stations aren't paying royalties you'll understand it and you can actually do something uh, from a legal standpoint. I think first and foremost, just educating yourself on the weird black box side of the music economy from the, the money standpoint, because there's a lot of weird stuff that you know we'll even musicians don't understand. So that would be super helpful, because I mean, um, one of my favorite people in Seattle is this guy named Ed Pearson. He's an attorney. Um, but he, he does both, um, he represented like Lamolo and uh, Macklemore. He did stuff with like the Lumineers and he, you know, he would represent them from a legal standpoint, but also he was handling all their publishing and licensing. So that's a path that I think is available to you. And hell, if you set up a publishing company here in Boise and we're representing the publishing and copyrights of artists here and getting it licensed, you would be talking to the music supervisors from the last panel and being like, I got artists, they need to be licensed, here you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Boom, that's a way that you directly can help this community be on the map. And uh, so I just want to also let you guys know we're going to have an, a mixer here as well. So if there are more questions that come up, please come over and chat with us. Um, we are super excited to talk and to learn about what you're doing and uh, what are your goals in this industry. And uh, with that, I think we're gonna, we're gonna wrap this panel up. I appreciate your time, um, your generosity with your attention and uh, coming out and chatting with us. So thanks so yeah. much. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.